I have said many times that there isn't a country in the world that would find billions of barrels of oil and leave it in the ground while there is a market for it. But it isn't enough to just exploit that resource, resource for our short-term interest. Our challenge is to use today's wealth to create tomorrow's opportunity. Ultimately, this is about leaving a better country for our kids than the one we inherited from our parents. Today, we are taking a strong step in that direction. We are here to announce the Government of Canada's decisions on major energy projects and the fulfillment of some very significant commitments we made to Canadians during last fall's election campaign. We said that major pipelines could only get built if we had a price on carbon and strong environmental protection in place. We said that Indigenous peoples must be respected and be a part of the process. And we said that we would only approve projects that could be built and run safely. That's how we've come to today's decisions. First, the Government of Canada has approved the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Expansion Project. This pipeline will twin an existing line that has been in operation since 1953, which extends from Edmonton, Alberta to Burnaby, British Columbia. The project will effectively triple our capacity to get Canadian energy resources to international markets beyond the United States. Thank you all so much for coming out today. To be part of the movement, thank you Greta for starting this journey. Who could have imagined where we'd end up today? In 1989, we did the first of many programs on global warming, on the nature of things. And that year, that year I interviewed more than 140 experts around the world and did a five-part radio series called It's a Matter of Survival. And that radio series had a huge impact. This is before the days of texting or uh, uh, internet emails. And we got 16,000 letters from Canadians saying, you scared the hell out of me, I agree with you, but what can we do? And that's when we established the David Suzuki Foundation uh, to try to answer their questions. But corporations, corporations increasingly dictate political priorities and policies. For decades, we have been working to educate people about climate change, its causes and its perils, and have urged politicians to take the steps needed to avoid the threat that climate change now poses, all with very little success. We will not stop this work, we will continue to educate and advocate because we cannot give up. But it has taken a child, Greta Thunberg, to point out that despite all of the promises, the treaties, the assurances, emissions continue to rise. Greta has pleaded with politicians to pay attention to scientists who are being ignored even as their messages have become more robust and more urgent. Young people are now striking, marching and protesting because they and their futures have become collateral damage from continuing political support of the fossil fuel industry, just so the industry can continue to carry on with business as usual. So now, it is time to bring the fight to the Canadian courts, and I am so honored to be able to support these courageous young plaintiffs in their litigation to fight for a future for themselves and for coming generations. Well, I'll, I'll start by just saying that the idea behind having these global temperature targets is that the world, and by that I mean the governments, people, need to define what level of climate change we think of as dangerous. And what happened is that the world doesn't agree on this. So the two degree target came mostly out of the developed world. It came mostly from Europe and North America. Uh, where small island developing states and, and countries in the developing world argued that we need a lower temperature target. And that's where the one and a half degrees came from. And 
the, the recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change shows that you know, the difference, that half degree difference between 1.5 and 2 can be really significant uh, in terms of the amount of sea level rise we're going to see in the future, in terms of uh, the, the extreme heat waves, uh, frequency and severity of extreme heat waves around the planet, and in, in terms of some ecosystems, how they're going to survive. So for example, coral reefs, one of the, one of the things that I study, Coral reefs are extremely threatened under two degrees of warming, and it's unlikely that most of the world's reefs will be able to survive. With one and a half degrees of warming, more of them will be able to. And so that one and a half degree limit is really important to small island developing states and places in the tropics that depend on those systems. trick-or-treating skills from a ch as a child. Huh? Come on. Trick-or-treat. Yeah. Right. So we're going to start with our own chant and it's going to go trick-or-treat. Hear us speak. Trick-or-treat. Hear us speak. There's some things we all need. There's some things we all need. Solar, wind, health and school. Solar, wind, health and school. Wooden funding that billion of our dollars 
um, th th in subsidies. So let's figure out who it should go to. Is there anyone among us that could use a little help in these times of crisis with this crazy Frankenstorm coming? Yes! Yeah. Oh, what you! you yes. Hello. What have you got? Renewable energy! Renewable energy, okay, that could use some help. Anyone else? Anyone else? Climate research. All right, climate research, okay, that could use some help as well. Education. Education, wow, yeah, what a, what a novel concept. Anyone else, anyone else? Arts and culture and the wheat board. Well, this all sounds like pretty good stuff, but Harper, do you, do you see anyone else that might need some help? Community! Huh. Oh! Any of oh, Harper's some friends? No, oh! You've got some friends over there! Come on over, Shell, Suncorp, Sunoco Phillips, and, uh, and, and Bridge. Okay, well, so we got the $1.4 billion. Let's see. Who should we give it to? Should we give it to the these zombies over here? Yeah. Or the, the public? The corporations? Yeah. Or the people? The one percent? Or the ninety-nine percent? Well, it sounds like the people have spoken. Let's see who it goes to. The fossil fuel industry! really want that money. <laughs> Don't get too upset yet. We still have something for you guys that's going to help you out. Great. What do we got? Cuts! cuts. Oh. So we can cut funding to renewable energy. Oh. Renewable energy! No. Oh. And we can cut funding to climate research. Education? Cut. <laughs> The wheat board? Cut! That's already. Oh, oh man. But it doesn't stop here. There's a whole city full of places. So we're going to go trick or treating door to door until we get what we've been demanding. That's right. Let's go find where our money is going. Let's go find out where our money's going. My name is Jasmine Thomas. I come from a community located in the heart of British Columbia called Psychas. We are affiliated with the Young Dene Alliance and we're one of the many communities across this nation standing with the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. My community is located along the proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline route. But first of all, I should recognize, I should have did that first of all, you know, I'm honored to be in unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory. Oh, yeah. I'm honored to be a guest here to speak about what's potentially, or what is not going to happen in my territory. This Pipeline is only one, but many different pipelines proposing to come through our territories, proposing to cross over a thousand streams, major river watersheds that bear salmon that our people depend on, as people who travel by the canoe, people who fish, people who hunt, people who still gather those medicines. People who we are not going to put that at risk. You can do it! give you a little bit of background of some of the things that you know our communities have been doing lately have you all heard of the save the Fraser declaration so it started off a few years ago with 30 indigenous nations growing to 60 100 131 now we're over 167 indigenous nations and all the 75 communities that also, you know, supported the actions for defending the coast. And we saw over 10,000 people, you know, make a stand and say no. No to these pipelines, no to these tankers, and we're going to shut down these tar sands.
So the, the problem Canada has really right now is that on the one hand, the, the federal government is trying to take actions to address climate change, and on the other hand, they're trying to support uh, the fossil fuel industry within Canada. And there's a sort of political math to that, trying to balance the two sides, but the actual math doesn't look like it works very well in terms of the emissions reductions. So by, um, if Canada is, is, gonna, is going to meet its uh, target of reducing emissions by 30% below 2005 levels, it's gonna be really hard to do that while also expanding um, emissions from the oil sands and from, and from LNG. It will create 15,000 new middle-class jobs, the majority of them in the trades. This major initiative will get hard-working Canadians back to work, put food on the table for middle-class families, and grow and strengthen our communities. It will give much-needed new hope to thousands of hard-working people in Alberta's conventional energy sector who have suffered a great deal over the past few years. Aside from the many and obvious economic benefits, we approved this project because it meets the strictest of environmental standards and fits within our national climate plan. We will require that Kinder Morgan meet or exceed all 157 of the binding conditions set out by the National Energy Board. These conditions address potential impacts on Indigenous communities, the protection of local wildlife, and the offset of greenhouse gas emissions during construction. And let me say this definitively, we could not have approved this project without the leadership of Premier Notley and Alberta's climate leadership plan. A plan that commits to pricing carbon and capping oil sands emissions at 100 megatons per year. We want to be clear on this point because it is important and sometimes not well understood. Alberta's climate plan is a vital contributor to our national strategy. It has been rightly celebrated as a major step forward both by industry and by the environmental community. The, the Paris Climate Agreement set temperature targets and then allowed countries to, set, to um, come up with voluntary um, targets for themselves uh, for reducing their emissions. But the two don't necessarily equate. So even if all of the world's countries met their internal emissions targets that they set voluntarily under the Paris Agreement, the world would probably still warm by about three degrees on average. Right now, though, most countries are not set to meet those targets, so we're aimed more towards looking about a, a, a four-degree warming world. That is a substantially uh, different planet. That's a different climate than we have today. We're looking at much um, more frequent and more severe heat waves around the planet. We're looking at committing to the end of a lot of ecosystems around the planet, including Arctic ecosystems that depend on, on sea ice which in a four degree world, we would not have um, ice for some of the summer in the Arctic. Um, it would basically be the end of most of the world's coral reefs as we know it. And we would be spelling all sorts of other different changes in, in climate that affect agriculture, that affect water, etc. One of the most significant of those would be sea level rise. With four degrees of warming, our historical evidence suggests that you would eventually see the loss of the major ice sheets on the planet. Now that doesn't mean it would happen in the next few decades. You might see four degrees of warming this century. You won't see the loss of the, all of the Greenland ice sheet this century. But what uh, the warming that occurs now could fate that to eventually happen. And so we really are at this important pivot point in history where we have the, ch the chance now to change the emissions trajectory and to avoid the really severe, dangerous looking, you know, four degree warming future.
solar and wind and geothermal are the energy sources of the future for the transition. We have a lot of hydroelectricity in BC, but we don't need any more. We don't need new dams flooding indigenous land or farmland. So I wanted my carbon footprint to be get down to one person using one person's share of one planet, not six or seven planets like we're presently using carbon out of control. My name, respected woman, respected men, good people. My name is Hala Edenshaw and I'm a 16 year old. I am from the village of Massa, BC on Haidewai. I am from the Chitskine clan of the Haida Nation. In our culture, everything is connected to the lands, forests, rivers, plants, waters, and animals of Haidewai. Gathering resources from the land, cedar berries, salmon, sea, seaweed, medicine, is the foundation of who we are. I am a new speaker of the Haida language, a language that is embedded in our ancestral land. All of our supernatural and spiritual beings come from the places we have inhabited since time immemorial. Our language and culture is the land. Our ancestral knowledge of the land has led ours to be a culture and ethic of stewardship for the environment. That is why I am a plaintiff in this case to protect the land that my people have lived on and cared for for over 14,000 years. Our culture has been threatened for many years due to colonization, but I'm proud to be here today as part of a movement that is working to protect the Haida land and in turn, our language and culture because learning a language is not enough when the climate crisis is literally knocking on my back door. My elders have told me stories about our rivers being full of salmon, but for most of my life, these rivers have been empty. The yellow cedar trees, central to much of our culture, are dying. The loss of cedar bark means that there will be fewer people leaving with the bark and fewer teachers to pass that knowledge on to the next generation. I am a plaintiff in this lawsuit because if nothing changes soon, my siblings will never feel cultural security and will have to wonder if ours is the last generation to be able to access our lands and waters for cultural needs. I am fighting to protect my family, culture, and beliefs. My right to liber life, liberty, and security of the person are being violated by climate change impacts that I am experiencing and will continue to experience if the government continues to contribute to climate change. If we do not act now, my people's entire way of life is at risk. We are here asking you to stand with us in our quest to seek justice against our government's intentional creation of a fossil fuel energy system that they know harms us. Our government has recognized that there is a climate emergency. Yet our government continues to purchase pipelines and subsidize fossil fuel infrastructure. Stand with us in our demand for justice and help protect myself, my culture, and my constitutional rights, as well as those of my people. Dung ik yakudungum, ik ga of istalsung, hod gay iskan klagay on klagyakudungsung. Hola. We respect you. Please join us in respecting our future. Thank you. I'd say to the children of the future, love where you live love the land and the water where you live. Uh, a family is not just your mother, father, brothers, sisters, aunties. We're all related on, we're all children of our mother earth. 
And it's up to all of us to take care of Mother Earth. It's not up to just the chosen few or the natives or the environmentalists. It's up to everybody to care for our mother. And when our, if our mother earth is dying, then so are we. So really take care of our mother the earth. And we ended up at the UN in 1992 speaking to the Earth Summit. I was able to speak to the delegates. I told them that they must change their ways. I told them that I was scared at what I was seeing here in British Columbia, but also what I was hearing from the scientists. We said together, my friends and I, that losing an election was not like losing, uh, sorry, losing a future was not like losing an election or a few points on the stock market. I asked them to remember their true role, these politicians, their true role, not as politicians or as professionals, their true role as mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles, and to remember their own children when they made their decisions. I asked them to make their actions reflect their words. Now 27 years later, I can't believe that people are still talking about a speech that I gave when I was 12 years old. I've done a lot of things, I've grown up, I've stayed involved, but people care most about a child speaking truth to power. And I think that this shows the significance, the importance of the voice of young people. and I'm an indigenous youth standing in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en, standing in solidarity with the Tayandanaga, the Gitsan, and the Shekwetmukh, who stand with the Wet'suwet'en. We stand with indigenous land defenders everywhere who are getting criminalized by unconstitutional injunctions for simply occupying their traditional territory and abiding by our ancestral laws and governance systems, which have never allowed for trespass, which have never allowed for protocols to have so violently been broken when the world witnessed indigenous matriarchs with swords and matriarchs be ripped from their place of ceremony and honoring missing and murdered indigenous women and be arrested in the name of a piece of paper in the name of an injunction that prioritizes the profit of a pipeline over indigenous livelihoods we saw reconciliation a colonial facade that Canada has never, never fulfilled, come crashing down on that day. For us Indigenous youth, our childhood has been witness to false promises and performative commitments by Canada that again have never been fulfilled in a meaningful way. As Indigenous youth, we declare that reconciliation is dead and that we set the terms for Canada's relationship with us on our lands, on our traditional territories, and for our future. We are moved by something greater than us, the force of our ancestors that we stand upon, the love for our lands and for our waters, that compels us to do what is necessary so future generations of Indigenous youth never have to face armed police on their own territories. Because that is what our parents' generation did, and our grandparents' generation did. And that's why we are allowed to gather in groups that are larger than three, speak our languages, practice our cultures. Yet we are still being ripped from ceremonies. Matriarchs and youth and elders and chiefs are still being ripped from our lands, violently. Reconciliation is dead but our resilience and our lands, our waters, our peoples, and our resolve to protect them 
is very much alive. Thank you. There would be too much. There would be too much that I would want to give to her. Just say that one. It would be everything she's ever given to me. It would be lakes, rivers, valleys, flowers, the sunsets, the sunrises, thunderstorms, clouds, and rainbows. Like it would be everything. Grandmother rocks and grandfathers and just it would be the flames it would be it would be the pine needles it would be the call of a raven it would be the soar of an eagle it would be just everything that I could ever put into it and it would be never ending the pole would stretch farther than the earth's circumference it would just it would be farther than the stars it would be It'd be something I could never accomplish without a huge community, generations and generations before and after me to create this. Um, so it would be indescribable almost. It would be something we could never accomplish, but something we'd always strive for. And that would be amazing if we really could do that. If we could ever concentrate on something so purposeful and keep away from all these unpurposeful things that we keep ourselves distracted with. I think it would be beautiful than anything I could ever imagine.